Jaya. Jashoda Nandana Braja Jana Ranjana Jashoda Nandana Braja Jana Ranjana Jamuna Tira Banachari Yamuna Tira Banachari Jaya Radha Madhava Kunja Bihari Jaya Jaya Radha Madhava Kunja Bihari Jaya Gopi Jana Bala Bhagiri Vanadari Jaya Gopi Jana Bala Bhagiri Vanadari Jaya Jasoda Nandana Braja Jana Ranjana Jasoda Nandana Braja Jana Ranjana Jasoda Nandana Braja Jana Ranjana Jamuna Tira Banachari Jamuna Tira Banachari Jaya Radha Madhava Kunja Bihari Jaya Jaya Radha Madhava Kunja Bihari Jaya Jaya Radha Madhava Kunja Bihari Jaya Jai Om Vishnu Pad Paramahansa Parabhajakacharya Asutara Sutta Sri Simad His Divine Grace A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai Iskam BBT Founder Acharya Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai All glories to the assembled devotees All glories to the assembled devotees All glories to the assembled devotees All glories to Sri Guru and Gauranga Glories to Srila Prabhupada Hari Hare Krishna So today we'll, we'll continue We'll check on anyone remember the last thing I mentioned yesterday? <laughs> I ended on saying, describing the picture of Prabhupada showing me how to fold the chatter, both of our hands on his chatter. So that was again the very beginning. Srila Prabhupada was successful huh, for two reasons. We all know these two reasons. Successful in spreading Krishna consciousness all around the world. What are the two reasons? What did he bring with him? Well, yes. <laughs> hmm? The holy name. But even more important than that, and more important than his Bhagavatams, what did he carry? The order of his spiritual master. You cannot have any success. You may think you're having success. And you can be successful on certain levels. This is what we've learned through history. 
this kind of history, that's what they say. If, if you don't learn history, you repeat history. You know, you have to learn from history. So New Vrindavan, we're going back, way back in the beginning. I just read a letter from 1968 this morning to Hayagriva. They were ready to buy an, another farm. And Prabhupada said, if, if you can do it, if you have the manpower to do it, he said, it's okay. He said, but you have so much land already, you're not doing anything with it. Hmm? Not that we just, he was buying hundreds of acres, hundreds of acres, hundreds of more acres, and Prabhupada said, you have to use the land. We're not just buying it to have land. He said, so if you can do something with it, it's okay. Consult with others. We always consult. We don't act independently. He said that the price is nice. They sent Prabhupada the um, offer, the real estate offer. And in the offer, it went back to 1903. This is 1968. In the offer it said, we're selling you this property, but we maintain the rights to what's under the earth, just in case we ever want to use it. What was under was coal. Coal. So they wrote Prabhupada and he said, not possible you can sign such an agreement. He said, we're trying to develop here a uh, New Vrindavan. Prabhupada's idea of New Vrindavan was Vrindavan. <laughs> Very simple. Going to call a place New Vrindavan it has to be like Vrindavan. Prabhupada saw Vrindavan, of course, when he was there in the 50s, the 60s. He always told us 5,000 temples. We couldn't imagine what that meant. Maybe it meant 5,000 storefronts. That's all we had. We had a storefront in 26 Second Avenue. We had a storefront in San Francisco. They thought that's what temples meant, a storefront. You know? But no, Prabhupada had a vision. Like I say to this day, Vrindavan, you go five minutes outside of that town, village, whatever you call it, and it's nothing but farming going on. Just like I said, flowers, they grow Tulsi everywhere to, to provide Tulsi for all the temples. Flowers everywhere they're growing. You see in Krishna Balaram Mandir, one day the altars, no flowers. Next day you can't see the altars. All over flowers. This last month it was jasmine. Everywhere jasmine. So this was Prabhupada's vision, Vrindavan, right from the spiritual world. Everything self-sufficient. From the beginning, Prabhupada didn't have them, so go find New Vrindavan. That was also an independent idea. Kirtanananda, I agree with it, they bought that farm place. But now they're asking Prabhupada. So he wanted them to develop properly. He even said in that letter, he said, Brahmacharis, Sannyasis, and um, Vanaprastas. He said, develop this temple in that way. But he was very concerned. He said, we don't even want to be around where they're doing this biz coal. He said, coal oil business. He even mentioned oil. Mm -hmm. And what was his instruction? <clears throat> Seven temples. You know, I was there in New Vrindavan from 1971. I traveled with Kirtananda Maharaj, and then I left with Prabhupada in 1972 in August. Then again, I was back there in 1974 for a short time, but there wasn't any evidence of doing what Prabhupada wanted. And what did he say? In, in the 60s, he said, you build me a place, and I'll show you how to develop it. That also didn't happen years and years and years are going by. You know, New Vrindavan, when I was there, I told you where I met Prabhupada and became his servant. Maduban, little rancher farmhouse. It's not there anymore. The temple I sat in front of Prabhupada at classes in Bahulaban, it was an extension off of the original farmhouse, the main temple. 
the entire place isn't there anymore. Hmm? I'm going to tell you two stories. So I was with Prabhupada from August of 1970. There's so many things I want to say. So much, so little time. Uh, so now it's April 1973. So I've been with them for over six months. Prabhupada in a few letters, <laughs> he told Kirtanananda, Shruta Kirti appears very sincere, very good boy. He would say these things, very good boy. I was a boy. So after being with them for six months, and that was my life, traveling around. Now we're in Mayapur. And Prabhupada went across the Ganga to visit his god brother, Sridhar Maharaj. So, of course, we had heard about his god brothers this way. We had heard different stories, some nice things, some not so nice things. But Sridhar Maharaj was very affectionate. He was good friends, they were. And he said, he said, I even see him as my shiksha guru. That was also Prabhupada's humility. So we go visit, and Prabh Sridhar Maharaj is sitting up in a bed. One of the first things I noticed was, you know, the bed had the four posts underneath, and on each post was a little clay cup filled with water. <laughs> Keep the bugs from going up the bed. These things to me I found very interesting. <laughs> it was a different world all the time. But now we're sitting and, of course, Prabhupada came, they embraced, and they talked a little in Bengali, and Prabhupada spoke in English. There was no one there that spoke English except me. Sridhar Maharaj spoke English, but he didn't have to speak English to him. He could obviously, he didn't have to say anything for my benefit. He was speaking with his god brother. But he spoke in English. And he started telling Sridhar Maharaj, how the preaching is in America. All over, they're making so many devotees. Thousands. And he said they're distributing tens of thousands of books. Srimad Bhagavatam, Bhagavad Gita, my disciples are distributing so many books. And he said, and I'm sitting right next to him on the floor. And he said, and they're getting ten dollars a book. Isn't that right, Sruta Kirti? Yes, Prabhupada. He said, and I need help. I have all these disciples need training. He said, you come to America. <laughs> he said, you go to Chicago. <laughs> you can go to Detroit. He said, temples are there. He said, I'll provide you with everything. He said, you help train my disciples. And I'm sitting there thinking, what is Prabhupada saying? This is Prabhupada's society. He's done everything. My spiritual master, he doesn't need any help from anyone. I'm thinking, he's asking Sridhar Maharaj, you come there. He said, you come there, you preach, you train them. He said, in Sruta Kirti, he'll be your servant. Isn't that right, Sruta Kirti? <laughs> Whatever you say, Prabhupada. Sridhar Maharaj said, maybe next lifetime. He said, my health is not so good. And then Prabhupada stopped. They had a pleasant time. And Prabhupada moved on to other things. I'll never forget that. He said, Sruta Kirti will be your servant. <laughs> Prabhupada is going to give me away. <laughs> How can he do that to me? Prabhupada knew he wasn't going to accept as well. But he offered him that. And I'm thinking, that was really interesting. Because up to this time, it was evident. There wasn't any help coming from anyone. That was also just to show Prabhupada's greatness. That was Krishna's way of showing this person. He's the person who's going to save the whole world. He doesn't need anyone else. Prabhupada, Krishna showed us that over and over and over again. But still, for me, it was a little bit bewildering. But I was not a person that asked Prabhupada a lot of questions. I could have said, Prabhupada, why did you do But I didn't. 
I was in Alachua uh, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, who knows? If this Hari Sari was living there at that time. We had very little intersecting. Of course, we knew each other. We knew each other. We knew everything we needed to know about one another. He served Prabhupada, I served Prabhupada, personally massaged Prabhupada. So I told that story. Hari Sari sitting next to me. So when I was done, he said, the same thing happened with me. 1976 it was three years later. He said, I'm sitting there. He said, the Prabhupada, Prabhupada sometimes, he would say, same thing. He said, just the same way. He said, you come. You come to America. You help me. I have so many disciples. They need training. So he went on and on saying the same thing. And then Hari saw, he said, so after, he said, I asked Prabhupada, <laughs> you offered this service to your godbrother Sridhar Maharaj. He said, you've been traveling around the world. This time he's already traveled around the world a dozen times, 14 times. You've done everything. But yet you offered this service to your godbrother. Prabhupada said, yes. He said back in 1935, when Prabhupada was there before his spiritual master, Bhakti Saranta Saraswati Thakur, he said, my spiritual master, he said, he said to me, he said, our Sridhar Maharaj, he's a very expert preacher, understands the philosophy completely. He said, but he's very shy. He said, you encourage him to preach. That's all Prabhupada needed to hear. This order from his spiritual master. All he needed to hear. Prabhupada would have turned the whole society over to him if he said, I'd preach. Because his spiritual master told him, you encourage him to preach. That's what it takes to be successful in Krishna consciousness. It's so easy. You just hear from your guru and you do what he says. And you don't do anything else. Prabhupada said, no addition, no subtraction, no dilution. And you'll be successful. Prabhupada would always say, what am I? He said, I'm simply postman, messenger. I carry the message. You may like it, you may not like it. Not my business. I simply deliver the message. And the longer I was with Srila Prabhupada, the more I saw how much he followed. He said five, six times I was with my spiritual master personally. But during those times, he heard certain things. The very first time, he said, I couldn't even understand my spiritual master, he spoke such lofty terms, big, big words. <laughs> he said, but I listened, I heard. He said, and he saw that, this boy he hears. Even we know he said initially he asked a question to one of his god brothers about something. Immediately his spiritual master said, pay attention. So each little thing. You sell this marble, print books, everything. For Prabhupada, it was his life and soul. So when he came to America, Prabhupada definitely had complete unflinching faith in the Maha Mantra. And he also had that unflinching faith in every word of his spiritual master. And he thought, whether I'm successful, not successful, I'll just do what he said. Nothing more, nothing less. We hear the stories. He would sometimes sit at the dock thinking maybe I'll go. So many months have gone by, nothing is going on, maybe I'll go back home. Don't think he for a moment was going to go back to India. There was no question Prabhupada was going to go back to India. He had his order from his spiritual master. The very first thing we have to do is, <laughs> and the only thing, 
is to follow the instructions of our spiritual master. Put it right there in front. I see so many people put their tattoos now, you know, now everybody's tattoo crazy. If you want to put something on there, put, just follow your guru. All this other business, don't even bother. I thought of putting Prabhupada's lotus feet on my head. Tattoo of his lotus feet on my head. That was the only tattoo I thought of doing. There's other story. Now this is with Hari Sari, Hyderabad. They're going to open the grand opening of the Hyderabad temple, Jamastami, 1976. So Prabhupada gets there days before. Like every project we've ever done, nothing is ready. Almost good enough. They were ready to open. Prabhupada's room was not finished and of course they're concentrating on the temple to get it ready for the opening and they wanted Prabhupada to stay somewhere else no I want to stay in my rooms so all of a sudden everybody has to get Prabhupada's rooms ready enough to stay they're not finished and Prabhupada said I understand you're getting ready for the installation but I'm staying in my room so feverishly, of course, they got everything. They didn't even have doors on the, the doorway. They had to hang curtains. One doorway, I've never been there, one doorway apparently goes, you can even see the temple room. So they're hanging curtains, sweeping all that marble dust, you know, from cutting and everything they do, all the sand. And they got it, and Prabhupada was in there. And then, of course, they went on. The next day, this is Hyderabad. Huh? Even in Vrindavan, they brought the Brahmins from South India just to satisfy the critics in Vrindavan. So they did the same thing there. Hari Sari says they were nice. They spoke with Prabhupada, and of course, they gave him all the paraphernalia after the ceremony. I don't even, you get these, you know, this string and that thing and this thing around. So many things they gave Prabhupada. And then the next day they came to Prabhupada's room. And they spoke and they presented Prabhupada. We said they had a gift for Prabhupada, a Shalagram Shila. We were not worshipping Shalagram Shila, you know. But they brought it to Prabhupada. It sat on Prabhupada's desk for a couple of days. He said, we'll bring it to Juhu. And we'll put it on the altar for the opening. And then another day went by. Prabhupada said, call Prajumna. Prajumna. You all know who Prajumna is? Hmm? Prabhupada's Sanskrit editor. Beginning to end, Prabhupada's Sanskrit editor. Most wonderful person. Prajumna comes in. And Prabhupada said, they've given me this Shalagram Shila. So I'm thinking, would you like to worship? Yes, Prabhupada. <laughs> he said, okay. He said, my father, he had Shila. He said he would keep it in a little silk, I think silk bag around his neck. He said, so what you do? He said, you have a Shalagram Shila. He said, very simple, in the morning, he said, you oil, bathe, little chandan, offer a little fruit, of course, Tulsi. Tulsi word, must be Tulsi. If you didn't do anything, chandan, Tulsi, oil, little fruit, he said. One hour, everything finished. Not even. Everything finished, he said. He said, and if sometimes you can't do it, your wife can do it. Arandati. Your wife, she can do it. He said, then later on, you can give it to your son. Imagine Prabhupada giving such facility, huh? such service. Yes, Prabhupada, yes, Prabhupada. So then some time, now they're in Juhu. Guru Puja is going on in the temple room. 
Prabhupada sitting on the Vyasa sun, everyone offering flowers, devoted, doing aratik. Prabhupada, I told you, he sees everything. Where's Prajumna? Ah, I'll get him, Prabhupada. He's worshipping his Shalagram Sheila. Bring him here. A few minutes later, Prachumna comes down, offers obeisances, go up to Prabhupada. Prabhupada said, first Guru Puja, then your Puja. <laughs> yes. Everything, you don't do anything, you worship your Guru. Everything's coming through your spiritual master. Hmm? Everything. I was in Mayapur with Srila Prabhupada when he lived in a grass hut at the front of the property. I was there with him. Mosquitoes as big as sparrows, you know. I was with him in Vrindavan. Same thing. Temple wasn't ready. His rooms wasn't ready. I'm moving into my rooms. As soon as they, construction was almost done, halfway done. Prabhupada didn't go to Radha Damodar temple. No, my home is Vrindavan. There, Krishna Balaram Mandir, even it wasn't finished. Put me in my room. Same thing, they had to do the same thing. Get his room ready. Yeah, last October, I had to go to Mayapur. They decide they're bringing Prabhupada to the TOVP. Why? Because they can't get anything done without Prabhupada sitting there, making him do it. Hmm? I don't know what's happening now. But if you think you can come up with a better plan than your spiritual master, you've already failed. You can build thousands of temples all over the place. But if you haven't fulfilled his desire, you're a failure. I saw it over and over again. First you take care of me. Put me in my room. What are you thinking you're doing for the deities? You're so wonderful. You're so advanced. In Mayapur one evening, my god sister, she was serving Prabhupada as prasadam. So he rang the bell. I want hot milk. So she goes down into the kitchen there in the Lotus Building. Radha Madhava's kitchen. This is 1976. Nothing else. One building's there. The wall is there. Prabhupada wants his hot milk. Every night. Hot milk. Every night. Boiling hot milk. You can't even touch the cup. It had to be that hot. One time devotee brought in his milk. Prabhupada says, it's not hot. Make it hot. Comes back five minutes later. Prabhupada says, he's just standing there with the cup. Prabhupada says, it's not hot enough. He said, Prabhupada, I just heated it up. It's hot. He says, you're holding the cup. <laughs> it's not hot enough. Spiritual master gives you an order. It's very specific. It can be very, it could be general, but it can be very, very specific. So this devotee, Mataji, she's down there, goes into the kitchen. Another Mataji, she's preparing Radha Madhava's plate for the evening offering. She's heating up the milk. There's no milk anywhere. They got a little milk. Maybe there's one, two cows squirting a little milk out of it, you know. So, conflict. Yeah, we mentioned conflict. Inevitable. Two people means a conflict. <laughs> So she says, I need that milk for Prabhupada. I'm taking the milk. Oh, the Pajari, Radha Madhava's Pajari, also a, a Mataji. No, 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 this is for the deities. They start fighting. <laughs> Prabhupada's cook there. She says, there wouldn't be any Radha Madhava without Srila Prabhupada. You don't give the milk to Prabhupada wants his milk. She understood. Who am I? Hmm? So they battled. 
Fortunately, the girl serving Prabhupada was literally a head taller than the other girl. So she finally grabbed her. She threw her out of the kitchen and locked the door and heated up the milk for Prabhupada and brought it up to Prabhupada. Prabhupada in his wit and understanding brings up the milk. Is everything okay? Yes, Prabhupada, everything's fine. <laughs> Don't think you have any ability to do anything on your own. We're nobody without our spiritual master. Prabhupada told them in New Vrindavan, build seven temples. Somehow or other over the years, that translated into they built this magnificent structure, Prabhupada Palace. Thousands of people in West Virginia to this day, there's a big sign on a freeway major interstate highway it says palace of gold exit doesn't say new Vrindavan, seven temples biggest tourist attraction in america no it was the palace of gold and now they're spending a few million dollars to try to restore that palace but Prabhupada's desire it didn't get fulfilled there there was a devotee there <laughs> You all know, Maharaj, he took that desire. He had that, it was Prabhupada's desire. Is all he did was accept it. He always accepted it. He told me, whatever I, I'm told I do. But he understood that instruction very nicely. I never imagined a new Vrindavan had to be ha happen in India. I just never thought, you know. <laughs> It's India, you already have a Vrindavan, you don't need another Vrindavan, but you do, because Prabhupada wanted one. And somehow or other, if you take his order to heart, you can make things happen. You can be magnificent. Hmm? You know, 1970, Radhanath was sitting on a little chair in Vrindavan overlooking a field of corn or something with a shotgun that Kirtananda Maharaj gave him because they're eating all the crops, the gophers. He said, you see one? <laughs> so he would see a gopher, he'd put the gun down, run over, <laughs> scare him away. <laughs> he wasn't going to shoot anything. <laughs> but he tried to satisfy that order. Hmm. Then he was given Shalagram Sheila's Kirtan Ananda Maharaj told him, Prabhupada told him, Pujari, I don't say this, so you Pujaris don't get puffed up. They're very, very important people in the temple. Because by the level of worship the deity receives, everyone in the community benefits or doesn't benefit. Hmm? We know Prabhupada said the GBCs. He compared them to the 12 Mahajans because <laughs> there were 12 GBCs. He said, everything that happens in ISKCON, 10% of the karma goes to you. You GBC now, huh? <laughs> As Mara said, love is responsibility. Not just that you, you know, you're, you're going to your transcendental Disneyland every day. No. It means you're going to work like anything your entire life to try to satisfy the order of your spiritual master. But he said the Pujari must be first class. His service must be first class because whatever he does, it's felt all over the community. In my travels with Prabhupada, there was, there was a thing that he did. You know how you say, you have a big pot of rice, big vat of rice. So all you have to do is pick up one piece of rice. If it's cooked, the whole vat's cooked, right? That's cooking, those of you who know how to cook. And everyone should know how to cook a little something. So Prabhupada in his travels, one time, 1975, we go to Mexico City. From the airport to the temple, we had a police escort. Prabhupada was 
right out of the airplane, didn't even have to go into the airport, nothing. He got ushered right in. There were like three, you know, limousines. And Prabhupada's in the back of this Cadillac limousine. I'm sitting next to him, and Sanyasi GBC is, Redainanda Maharaj is there. So, of course, he was speaking Spanish. So he was getting books translated into Spanish for the BBT. So the whole ride to the temple, he's telling Prabhupada all about how many books are getting printed, how many books are getting distributed. And Prabhupada was unusually quiet because that's very exciting. Prabhupada's books, what is more important? Nothing, <laughs> right? Who would disagree? Prabhupada always said, most important you distribute my books. But this whole ride, it was a half an hour long. Yes, Maharaj is talking to Prabhupada and Prabhupada just sitting. Then we get to the temple. Prabhupada, of course, takes darshan of the deities, offers Dandavat's beautiful deities they have. 1975, this is February 1975. Prabhupada greets the deities, everything, says a little something, and he goes up to its room, somewhere around noontime. Prabhupada said, to me, you can bring me the deity plate, Rajabhog offering, you can bring me that for lunch. When he would say that to me, I become so happy because that was my biggest anxiety because when I cooked for him, the cooker would be in one room, maybe another building, and I'm massaging Prabhupada. And there's rice, dal, and various subjis in there cooking. How long can something cook? Prabhupada's massage was an hour and a half, hour 15, sometimes hour 45 minutes. I couldn't break massage. I got to go turn off the cooker now, Prabhupada. Otherwise, everything's going to be burnt, mush, whatever. Mm -mm. You, had, you had to become experts yourself. And you also had to have the mercy of Srimati Radharani. I never burnt one time in the cooker. Never undercooked anything. It wasn't to my, <laughs> it wasn't my credit. Just keep that flame very, very low. <laughs> and be in anxiety the whole time you're massaging. <laughs> and, and in that way, Srimata Radharani, she would be very merciful to you. You'd come and everything was perfect. And then you'd spend 15 minutes. I'm saying, so when he said, bring me Raj Bhog offering, I was like, hey, <laughs> I can just massage without any anxiety. <laughs> so then I brought him it. And I know, I already knew because I did it three, four times. And it was like, it was like carbon copies, you know? It was like a, a rerun each time. He had the plate, and they're the deity's plates. No transfer. Prabhupada's eating off the deity's silver plates. How could Prabhupada eat off of Krishna's plates? Sometimes devotees would ask me, over and over I hear this, when you cook for Prabhupada, did you offer it? I'd say, yeah. I'd say, I cook everything, I bring it into his room, put it on his table and offer it to him. <laughs> I'd offer my obeisances and leave. He said, well, you didn't offer it to the deities? I said, I don't offer anything to Krishna. I said, I offer it to my spiritual master all the time. It's all we do. If you think you're offering to Krishna, you're an illusion. <laughs> We offer through the disciplic succession. I can show you letter after letter after letter, Prabhupada describing how to offer to Krishna. Once on the train, you all know train. Here in India, we all know trains, the joy of being on a train. I came here, overnight express train. And Prabhupada was on a train. You know, what was Prabhupada's pet name as a child? Huh? Kachori Muki. Vest, he had Kachori stuffed all over the place. He liked his Kachori so much. Huh? Prabhupada liked Kachoris. 1970 in India, you could get nice Kachoris. 
at the train station. You know, when the train go to the station, some stations stop for one minute, some five minutes like that. So they stopped at the station there in Mathura. Prabhupada knew everything. He told his disciple, you go to this man. He said, you can get kachuris. He said, we'll have kachuris. So the devotee goes, gets the kachuris. You know, the nice little, whatever, little table coming out, second class AC style thing. So the devotee, of course, a Brahmin, you know, we, we had a little bit of training, us Westerners, cleaning the table, everything nice, puts the kachuris, makes, puts the kachuri, and Prabhupada just sitting there, you know, watching him. And then he starts to go down on the floor. Prabhupada says, what are you doing? He said, I'm offering the kachuris. He said, I'm right here. <laughs> Who are you offering to? Who are you? You're offering kachuris. I'm sitting here. I didn't know anything, but somehow or other, Paramatma, he gave me a lot of common sense sometimes when I was with Prabhupada. I never imagined I had to do anything. I was cooking for Prabhupada. I told you, went in the kitchen in Los Angeles. Los Angeles was like just south of the, they called it the, you know, in the middle of America was called the bread basket, corn, wheat. On the west, California, that was like um, San Joaquin Valley. That was like the fruit basket. Oranges, strawberries, you name it, grapes, everything was there. Ideal situation to grow. Back in those days, 1970, things weren't so contaminated. Now everything in America tastes like wax or something. Nothing has any flavor. It's been destroyed. Flowers don't smell anymore. We got a, my wife picked a gardenia yesterday. Gardenia is one of Prabhupada's favorite flowers. Gardenia garlands. Yes, write that down. <laughs> Next time I come, I want to see Prabhupada with gardenia garland and red roses. He'll be in ecstasy. He'll take you back to Godhead, you give him such a garland. So Prabhupada's in the kitchen. There's a little colander filled with bright red, juicy looking strawberries. So Prabhupada is walking around looking, checking the cleanliness in the kitchen. And then he sees the strawberries. What is this? Little young Brahmacharini. <laughs> They're all in the kitchen. They were all these young ladies, Prabhupada's Brahminical ladies, cooking, cleaning. Oh, they're strawberries, Prabhupada. <laughs> As if he didn't know. <laughs> but he had a purpose. Teaching, one-on-one, -on -one, he could teach you. Like that. So he grabbed one, and he's looking, and he... Prabhupada, it's boga. Throws it in his mouth. You have to understand who you're dealing with all of the time. Yeah. Prabhupada's position. So many we don't understand. All these things there weren't rituals. When I was Kirtan, uh, Prabhupada's servant, first became his servant, I would get letters. That was one of the reasons he put me in there, Kirtanananda. He gave me a picture of Radha Vrindavan and Chandra. He said that goes on Prabhupada's desk all around the world. <laughs> He was very clever, Maharaj. He was, he was, not that he, you know, he was smart. He said, you put that picture on Prabhupada's, yes, Maharaj, I'll do that. And I did that. And then he would send me letters, ask Prabhupada this. Rather than deal, because you sent Prabhupada a letter, it didn't go to Prabhupada, it went to the secretary, and then, of course, he would read it during massage or something. But he thought he had better than that now. He had his guy. <laughs> he had his man in there. You know, you have to get your man in there. Like Radhanath Maharaj has his man. <laughs> That's you. <laughs> um, so he sent one letter. And Govardhan Puj is coming up. And he asked Prabhupada about you know, we should start doing daily arti to the cows. <laughs> so I, 
I read to Prabhupada, <laughs> Sakirna Maharaj, he's asking about the cows if they should start doing arti to them. <laughs> Prabhupada laughed. He said, no. So why do you want to do arti to a cow? He said, polish its hooves. He brush it, bathe it. He said, polish the horns. It's a cow. He's not going to... He's not going to do anything. You, you know, offer him a flower. Or <laughs> he doesn't care. She doesn't care. Give them some nice greens. You know, like that, Prabhupada said. So I said back, no, no, Prabhupada said, no, you don't need to do arati to the cows. Just take care of them nicely. Hmm? Then another, I get another letter. And Kirtananda, he writes, when we're do this is Kirtan and Maharaj. It was 1966 he's been there. Prabhupada trained him up in everything. Cooking. Kitchen Ananda. He was known as Kitchen Ananda. When we're doing Aratik and we're offering to the different parts of the body, he says, what should our meditation be? Prabhupada said, what meditation? He said, you're offering to the deity, to the different parts of their body. There's no backstory that you have to understand some super esoteric meaning that you're, no, you're offering artik, you're offering them incense, you're offering dupes, you're offering flowers to the Lord. Right? Like we say, the Lord can eat with his eyes, doesn't need his mouth, so you offer everything. He accepts through devotion. Nothing can happen properly so many things can happen so much development can be there but if you're not on course we were sitting in the train you know whatever it was 13 hours and I'm watching the tracks <laughs> beside me they're always parallel <laughs> you don't change not one what's the word for one to eleventh of a second <laughs> Yeah, you can't change, not even one ten thousandth part the tip of a hair if you change it. A few miles down the line, you're going to be in a totally different place. You have to be side by side all the time. And that one side of the order, the spiritual master. You can't deviate from that order. So when I see here what's happened, how this place has become... And I know it, GEV, Govardhan, Govardhan, of course, Vrindavan. This place is what Prabhupada wanted. He wanted a new Vrindavan. <laughs> he wanted to make that ideal place. It's so funny. We live in Vrindavan, my wife and I. She's been there the better part of 20 years. I've been there the last three years. We don't leave Krishna Balaram Mandir. When Prabhupada was there, he said, where's my secretary? Well, Prabhupada went to Madame Mohan, they're taking darshan here, they're taking darshan. Call them! They came in. Prabhupada said, I've put all of the holy places in the courtyard of Krishna Balaram Mandir. Why you have to just, it's restless, so restless person you can't even sit down for 10 minutes we're so restless to speak of an hour and a half chanting japa and Prabhupada said so many things about that he said sitting means sleeping <laughs> but that's not for everyone but if you're sitting and sleeping then walk around and chant japa don't look like a nonsense there with your head no <laughs> you got to become conscious so our consciousness, everything's coming through Srila Prabhupada and through your spiritual master. But of course we know this Prabhupada's ISKCON is Prabhupada's society. I heard this story way back from you guys when it becomes separate and then Kirtanananda was gone there in Mumbai. Radhanas there, <laughs> what do I do? What do I do? Should we join, go to Gaudiya Matwe? Or we can go independent way and do this? Or do we become part of 
ISKCON, <laughs> scary ISKCON, <laughs> so organized, so many rules, regulations. So the devotees, they weren't inclined so much to be part of ISKCON. He said, I'll do whatever you like. So then they came and talked, and what did he say? What will happen to me if we do anything else, if we're not part of this kind? He said, who am I going to associate with? Hmm? For spiritual master, just association with their disciples, that can be very dangerous, as we've seen dozens of times. Huh? If you only have your disciples bowing down for you to tell you what you're the most marvelous person in the whole world, you're not even part of this world, if you start to think like that, that's the beginning of the end. Hmm? Maharaj appreciates his God brothers. One of the, I appreciate so many things about Radhanath Maharaj. One of them is how he, he treasures association with his God brothers. Because they give you balance. <laughs> they help you. You can talk with them. You have to be able, we know, from Upadesha Amrita, this is one of the things. Imagine sharing yourself with another person. Huh? When, when I grew up in those days, I told you, one of the first things I heard was time, place, and circumstance. One of the other things we used to say very often was Krishna consciousness was based on love and trust how difficult it is to trust someone. Hmm? I didn't have anything. No, I told you, I was a fool, didn't even read. <laughs> I sat at so many classes of Srila Prabhupada, I would sit there, try to listen, try to pay attention. But what I did know, before I was even with him, is this person, He's not like anybody else. This person's from the spiritual world. I believed that. I accepted that. And whatever he says, it's perfect. Maybe I can't do it, but it doesn't mean it's wrong. In those dark 80s, I remember in, I was in New Dwarka, 1982, 1983, 1984. It was crazy. We had 12 Vyasasans in a temple room. 13, <laughs> counting Prabhupads. As God brothers, we couldn't figure out what, the, what was going on, what happened. What happened to Prabhupada's society? I used to sit out front during class sometimes. We didn't want to go to class. And my God brothers, they all had excuses. I'm not going to class because of this, and this person, this, and that person. Me, I thought, I'm not going to class because I'm in Maya. That's all. Your reasons. I see people go away from ISKCON. They think, oh, it's like this, it's like this, it's like this. And they think they're, they actually believe they're in control of the situation. They think on their own accord they're going away. They're being critical. No, no, no. Because of your critical nature, you have no place in Prabhupada's society. Maybe they can be following, they can be doing everything. That's okay. But if you get on that platform, I'm not doing, I'm not serving. Imagine, I see it in the temple all the time. I don't like this person, I'm not serving the deity. Oh, nonsense you are. In my book, there's one letter, Prabhupada letter in my book. If, if you don't need to get the book, but this letter you should read again and again and again and try to understand. This was back 1973. 1972, December 1972. Already we have the first faction in ISKCON. Siddhas Rup Sai. He was a yogi, kundalini yogi. Actually, he suffered the whole rest of his life from his kundalini, burn his <laughs> spine or whatever. I wouldn't know. <laughs> but very charismatic, obviously very advanced person from his previous life. 
Prabhupada gave him first initiation, second initiation, gave him sannyas, maybe all at the same time. He became Siddhasarupa Nanda Goswami. But when he came, he had his own following. Hundreds of very dedicated people in Hawaii. Some of them, they're here. Pushkar, Mahendra. So many people were, were there and they came to Prabhupada. But he didn't like the way things were going on. He was, he particularly didn't like our book distribution methods, Siddha. And Prabhupada is, you know, he would say, should it be like this, this, this? But book distribution was going on, most important activity. We would never say, You're, yeah, don't, don't pressure, don't do this. We say, you have to pressure. Who wants a book, who wants a book in the airport? You know, they're not just going to graciously take it from you. A little bit. And Prabhupada explained how to do it. But nonetheless, it had to be there. That was one of the things. See, most of they were Hawaii. Hawaii is this little island in the middle of nowhere. Then you have the, you know, passionate USA kind. So it was very different. Anyway, they, more and more they separated themselves. And in New Zealand, they were even getting their own temple. They didn't want to be around ISKCON people. And Prabhupada said, he tried so much to get everybody to work together. When I became Prabhupada's servant, he had Siddhasrup travel with him for two months because he understood that this person, he attracts so many people, but he needs to understand what to do properly, how to preach properly, what the philosophy is. He saw one of his books once, Jesus Loves Krishna, Krishna Loves Jesus. Prabhupada went through the book, Sid is there. I don't see anything about meat-eating Christians. <laughs> Prabhupada went boom, right to it. You're speaking all this nice flowery stuff. What about these people that are killing the cow? So Prabhupada was no nonsense. So said, yes Prabhupada, yes Prabhupada. So he traveled with Prabhupada, and it was interesting. But in this letter that came from Tushta Krishna, also Maharaj, Prabhupada, him traveling along with them as he was going Hyderabad, we were in Hyderabad together, all of Kartik together, 1972. But that division couldn't be stopped. So then Tushta writes a letter about his feelings and how much he would do anything for Siddha Sarup. But he finds these other devotees, you know, mudded visa, this GBC, that GBC, eh, can't work with them. And he understands, Tush to Krishna, he understands Siddha Sarup, he's a pure devotee. So he wants to follow him. And Prabhupada sent I didn't, if anyone can get the letter together before the end of the class, I can read different portions, but I'll tell you what I remember. It's a letter to Tushta Krishna, end of 72, early 73. So in the letter, Prabhupada says, yes, he said, Siddhis Rup is a pure devotee. He said, but I think you have a misunderstanding about pure devotee. He said, all of my disciples who are surrendered, they're pure devotees. He said, they may be Siddha Swarup, they may be a Siddha Swarup, not Siddha Swarup. He said, Siddha Swarup is a pure devotee. He said, Shaima Sundar is a pure devotee. He said, all of my disciples are pure devotees. He said, don't misunderstand. You don't make a faction, he said. Don't make a faction. This person I like, this person I don't like, this person I can follow, this person I can't follow. He said, all of my disciples, they're pure. He said, okay. 
he said in, and he said, let me see. Anyone sincerely serving the spiritual master is a pure devotee. It may be Siddhasarup or others, a Siddhasarup. This must be very clearly stated. It is not only that your Siddhasarup, like how he says that, not only your Siddhasarup. He could have just said Siddhasarup, or he could have said my disciple. He said your Siddhasarup. <laughs> is a pure devotee and not others. Do not try to make a faction. Siddhasrup is a good soul. But others should not be misled. See, this is what happens. Now you're not only... <laughs> you're not only destroying your own spiritual life, but now you're going to lead hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of people on this other course, this other track you've decided is more perfect than what's been given to you by Srila Prabhupada. It doesn't matter if Siddhasrup or non Siddhasrup. Amongst ourselves, amongst ourselves was 5,000 of us. One should respect others as Prabhu, Master, one another. As soon as we distinguish, here's a pure devotee, here's not pure devotee. That means I'm a nonsense. Why you only want to be in the spiritual sky with Siddha Swarup? Why not all? If Siddha Swarup can go, why not everyone? Siddha Swarup will go. Imagine such a blessing from Srila Prabhupada. Who could get such a blessing? Siddhasarup will go. You will go. He's talking to Tushta Krishna. Shaima Sundar will go. Another wonderful blessing for Shaima Sundar Prabhu. Huh? Next time you see him, you remind him. All obeisances to you. We will have another ISKCON there. If that scares you, you have a lot of work to do. <laughs> we have to learn to love one another. It's all based on love and trust. Huh? And first comes love. It's not trust in love. Oh, I trust you, I'll learn how to... No! First the love has to be there. Then you have complete unflinching faith. You have trust. You know, this person, whatever he says is for my benefit. And if I do it, my success is assured. Of course, Mr. Nair must stay. Well, maybe we'll talk about a little bit about Mr. Nair tomorrow if you don't understand that. That's very funny. <laughs> it's also <laughs> poor Mr. Nair. <laughs> And if somebody doesn't go, then I shall have to come back and take him there. So everybody's going. But don't put a burden on your spiritual master. One should remember this, and every one of my disciples should act in such a way that they may go with me, not have to come back and take another birth. As for your next question, can only a few pure devotees deliver anyone? Huh? There are so many answers to questions that are in people's heads or misunderstanding people have in their heads. If he is a pure devotee, he can deliver others. He can become spiritual master, but unless on that platform he should not attempt. Then both of them will go to hell like blind men leading the blind. Next, you ask if I'm in my picture and form. Yes! in form as well as in teachings. To carry out the teachings of Guru is more important than to worship the form. I was in Prabhupada's room every day. I didn't see, he wasn't doing a Guru Puja too. He was constantly worshiping his spiritual master. 
Anyway, it goes on. You send this letter, let everyone read it. If tomorrow we can speak about it even more. Um, I was going to say something else, I already forgot. So, I think you understand the point. And I think you can understand why Radhanath Maharaj is able to be successful in what he's doing. So many God brothers, they have, they see Maharaj doing this preaching, doing this here, doing this here. Oh, what's he doing that? Sometimes he doesn't have tilak on. Oh my God, he doesn't have tilak on. How can you do that? Tell them, come here. Go to Chalpati Temple. Go to the Bhakti Center. Look at his disciples and then decide what he's doing. Don't work off of some incomplete picture. Hmm? You, you, you people, you, you have decades of work here. I'm sure Maharaj is going to give it to you. You're not going to have one moment of rest. And you shouldn't. I, in the Prabhupada, some, some things he said I, I still don't understand. I saw it. I accept it. Prabhupada says, when you perform devotional service, you never get tired. I get tired. I feel tired all the time. <laughs> I'm, I'm not doing devotion. No, I become, you do, you become inspired when you do service. We all do. Who doesn't? In Vrindavan, he called one o'clock in the morning, Prabhupada rang his bell, Krishna Balaram. I'm right in the room behind him. That was the serving quarters in the, that year, 74, 75. I laid on the straw mat. Prabhupada would have to go from the sitting room through my room to get to the bathroom. And of course, he would be working from midnight, one in the morning, translating. I, I would wake up all the time hearing him translate. And I, in and out. Imagine. <laughs> you're, you're, you're falling asleep, you're in and out of consciousness, and it's all you hear when you're slightly awake is Prabhupada's voice speaking Srimad <laughs> Bhagavatam. Hmm? In Vrindavan, everywhere, Calcutta, wherever he was, it was the same. He would get up, he would have to use the bathroom, he'd walk through the servants' quarters, I'd hear, I'd hear a little shuffle, and I'd be lying down on my back, I'd roll over, do dandavats, take rest, take rest, he'd say, no, 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 take rest, take rest. Then a couple minutes later, he'd come back through, I'd roll over, do dandavats, no, 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 take rest, take rest. But the one morning, he rang the bell, he said, go get Guru Kripa. Guru Kripa, basically, his party paid for Vrindavan Temple. That was in the days before all of you were around donating money to build all these temples. It all came from America. Don't forget us. Don't leave us stranded. You wouldn't even know Krishna here if it wasn't for those American boys and girls and European boys and girls that surrendered anywhere from six months to their entire lives. Hmm. They did all of that. So have mercy on us Americans because Krishna consciousness is in a miserable state. That's why Maharaj left this place to go back there. It needs so much preaching in the West. Here it's all going to... Prabhupada knew it from the beginning. I don't have to preach to you. <laughs> he said, you're 90% Krishna conscious. We just need to turn you around. That was 50 years ago. Now maybe you're 40% Krishna conscious, 2020. You've developed all the bad habits from America. Thank you very much. We gave that to you. Because now you'll become devotees, because you'll see you're all wasting your time. The only reason to be an engineer is to come here, get this help, get this place together. All your big, big successes, what are you going to do with it? Big family, nice cars, all these things. We did all of that. Big waste of time. Don't waste your time. So I go get Guru Pika by knock on his door. One o'clock in the morning. He's sleeping. We're all sleeping except for Prabhupada. I said, Prabhupada wants to see you. Huh? Why? I thought, oh, hmm. why? What do I know? <laughs> he doesn't tell me anything. <laughs> I'm just the gopher. Go for this, go for that. And of course, I always accompany, whoever I get, I always accompanied them into the office because that was my excitement. 
I'm sitting in a room all day. I'm not reading newspapers, watching TV. My only excitement was to see what's going on, what's going on in ISKCON. We all want to know those. That's our, you know, our, our newspaper, right? This person did this, this person did that. So we go in, offer obeisances, sits up. Prabhupada looks at him. What are you doing? What were you doing? He said, well, I'm sleeping, Prabhupada. Why? I got hired. I'm not sleeping. Prabhupada, you're Hari Das Thakur. You're a Paramahamsa. Why aren't you a Paramahamsa? All right, go take rest. <laughs> that was Prabhupada. In Mayapur, after lunch, Mayapur, everyone had its particular, every place had its particular flavor with Prabhupada. Prabhupada loved Mayapur. Vrindavan was his home. Mayapur is place of worship. But he loved Mayapur, Lord Chaitanya, that mood. I knew when we went there and that lotus building was finished. Prabhupada would just walk around the huge verandas. The breezes were there. Mayapur, nice breezes. When we arrived there, <laughs> 73, no, 75 it is now for the festival. I'm a grahasta now. I have a wife and a child already. 1975, we're at the festival. We get up to his room. Prabhupada's looking out the veranda. So, Sruta Kirti Maharaj, how do you like it here in Mayapur? Very much, Prabhupada. But I could see Prabhupada just, just enjoying that atmosphere in Mayapur. And as a joke, he, twice he called me Sruta Kirti Maharaj. Once in New Dwarka, he said the same thing. We arrived in New Dwarka. My favorite place was New Dwarka, Los Angeles. Los Angeles is like the most degraded place in the world. I guess that's why it was my favorite place. I felt at home there. No, it was nice. The temple's beautiful. Rukmini Dwarkadish, the devotees were wonderful. Everything was nice. We arrived there. And again, he's looking out the window. He doesn't look at me to say it. He's looking out the window. He knows I'm behind. So, Sruta Kirti Maharaj, how do you like it here in New Dwarka? Oh, yes, Prabhupada, I like it very much. Yes, very nice, he said. So, Mayapur, Prabhupada had his sitting room and his bedroom. Right? Hopefully, you've seen it. You all should go there and see it if you haven't. And he just finished lunch. His lunch, he would eat in the bedroom. The choki table would be on the floor against the wall. That's always, that was the main 90% was against the wall with a little straw mat in front of it. He sat on the floor. And he usually sat like, like this. This is often how he pick and eat. So he's eating. And ants. Ants. And they knew Prabhupada's timings. You know, they, <laughs> such a little creature with a brain in there somewhere. Some tiny little brain. Like the mosquito. You know, there's one little hole in your mosquito net, the mosquito will find it. It's just Krishna's creation. It's just mind boggling. But the ants, breakfast, they had breakfast and lunch with Prabhupada. But they were very, very um, respectful. They didn't go onto Prabhupada's plate. But they, they had a plan. Every day, I had to deal with it every day. Prabhupada would be eating. Okay, you know the person in charge, the ant in charge, what is it called? The general. General ant. Time, everybody, we're going to get Mahaprasadam. You know. So Prabhupada would be eating. I'm walking back and forth with Japatis one at a time. So I can see as it starts. And I surround the table. And by the time he got to his finished the japatis, and he's mixing his rice. That was the last part. Mix the rice with the subjis, mix, the, mix it all up. Whenever I see devotees mix, I always think of Prabhupada. You know, we never learned that thing. I, to this day, I can't do that. You know? and 
I don't even like to do it. I'm a very separatist person. Everything's separate. Proper mix it all up. So the ants, now they know. It's getting close. He's almost done. Because after he's finished with that mix, then it's the sweet. Always a Bengali sweet there. Sandesh, Rasgula, Rasmalai, Gulabjumum, like that. So then he starts taking his sweet. Woohoo! They're now they're like, yeah, 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 yeah. Can almost hear their little shrieks. They know it's just minutes away. Soon as Prabhupada stood up, I had a battle on my hands because now the ants were all over his, just going on the plate. They were right there, but they waited patiently. You know, in Calcutta, when Pishima would bring sweets from KC Das, first time I had really tasted nice sweets. They were bona fide, Prabhupada said. You could just buy and eat there. It was so bona fide. KC Das. It was prashadam. It was automatically prashadam. Some things are just prashadam. Actually, Prabhupada said everything is prashadam. But until you realize it, you, there's a process you have to follow. <laughs> so she'd bring these sweets. And of course, Prabhupada, you come to his room, everybody got prashadam. You cannot see your spiritual master and not get prashadam. You have to get, there has to be a jar of sweets in his room. So the ants came. But I got excited. Because I thought, ah, ants have ruined the sweets. I'll tell Prabhupada, I'll take them out, wash the ants off, and I've got a whole box of Maha, <laughs> Maha Sandesh, Sandesh was in there. I won't mention there was chocolate Sandesh that would come. I can't mention that. So then one afternoon I go in and Prabhupada's sitting there. <laughs> you would have thought I was five years old instead of... 20 years old, Prabhupada, ants all over these sweets. Should I remove them? He looked at me. He said, they don't eat very much. <laughs> <laughs> then he said, go get a plate and a katori and come back. So I did that. Got the plate and the katori. Turned the katori upside down. He said, pour some water from his drinking jug there. He said, put the sweets on there. He said, problem solved. But I didn't get any sweets from that time, though. In Mayapur. So then after lunch, Prabhupada would take a nap. So everything's all finished. I have all my little services after lunch. Distribute prasadam, do this, do that. Come back, clean the table. I offer my obeisances, and Prabhupada's sitting up in the bed. He said, I hate sleep. <laughs> he said, it's just a waste of time. He said, I hate it. He said, I don't like it. I don't want to sleep. He said, simply wasting time. And then he laid down on his back. He grabbed a little sheep, pulled it over his head like a child. And again, the bewildering moment. I would get over and over, who is this person? Who is he? What's he do? He says like he's resting in, in a moment. He said that to George Harrison when he came in 73. George said, me too, Prabhupada. He said, I hate sleeping. He said, you can't get anything done, Prabhupada. said, yes, yes, I hate it, I hate it. <laughs> so then one more, one more little story, Mayapur. When Prabhupada would come to Mayapur, first time, what did I, knew not, everything for me was a first. First, so many first. First Vrindavan, got the Vrindavan, Kartik in Vrindavan, now I'm in Mayapur. And you know that road, and Bhakti Siddhanta Road there. And I don't know anything, but we come and, you know, there's temples there, Chaitanya Mahat on the way, Lord Chaitanya's birthplace. Bhakti Vinod Thakur there has a, um, what does he have there, a sabadi to, and of course Bhakti Siddhanta is there. So we come the first time, Prabhupada said stop the car. So I don't know, I think maybe he's going to go out, go into the temple, do, and Prabhupada, 
Okay, you can go. Didn't even go into the temple. Imagine. He said they made Bhaktivinoda Thakur a gatekeeper. <laughs> he, was, he was insulted. Every time, that's what he would do. He didn't go in. Anyway, while we're in Mayapur, his god brother's visiting him. One of his sannyasi god brothers has a little mandir down the road there. A tiny little thing. He has some disciples. He'd come see Prabhupada often in the afternoon. One day, after he leaves, Prabhupada calls me in. He says, when Maharaj comes, he said, I don't want to see him. He said, all he does is gossip. Gossip was a word Prabhupada used. Didn't say prajalpa. He would say gossip. Gossip, ooh, such a It's prajalpa, but it's such a nasty word. It's talking about other people. That's the low, lowest form of communication is gossip. Talking about others. He said, I don't want to see him. It's all he does. He says, he tells me, this God brother is doing this, this is doing that. And they're criticizing you because you don't stop at the temple. You don't even come offer respects to your spiritual master. You want to see Lord Nershingadev come out of a pillar. You say something to Prabhupada philosophically that's off, that's what you get. You get Lord Nershingadev rip you apart. You get eyes turning red. Shuddering, Prabhupada banged his hand down on the table. Of course, the spiritual master. He said, I'm with my spiritual master every moment. I'm following his instructions. Every moment. That was it. He tolerated everything else he said. That was... He didn't send him out, but when he left... He said, I don't want to see him. All he does is criticize. All he does is gossip. This is going on. This is going on. This is like this. 24 hours go by. I'm the guard at the top of the stairs. I guess it was the first floor, second floor of Prabhupada's room. And it's 2 in the afternoon and Prabhupada's resting after lunch. So this Maharaj comes up the stairs, Prabhupada's godbrother. And I'm there. I'm here to see Maharaj. It's Prabhupada's god brother. What does Maharaj tell you about his god brother? You got the respect. Hopefully, it's, I'm sure he says that to you. I know he does. I see it. What do I do? I say, oh, Prabhupada's resting. I had an easy excuse. Prabhupada's resting. He can't see you now. He told me. Imagine. He said, you told me. Anytime I want, I come and see him. I said, yes, but he's resting. I said, I can't wake him up. I said, I can't do that. As we're having the conversation, what happens? Prabhupada opens the bedroom door. Of course, he's right there. Right there for his disciple. Defend his disciple. Maybe. Maybe not. I don't know. But he opens the door. Oh, Prabhupada's so beautiful. One of the most beautiful images I have of Prabhupada is his coming out of that door. No kurta, summertime. His dhoti looks like somebody rang it out before they let it dry. Wrinkled all over because he got out of the bed. And he, he looks kind of transcendental in this outfit standing there. And I'm just looking at him. And he said, oh, Maharaj, you're here. He said, go sit down, I'll be right there. And I'm saying, Oh boy, I'm in trouble now. And he says, I'll be right there. And Prabhupada walked down to the end of the building. That was his bathroom, big, big bathroom. It was for all the rooms, four rooms, but it was his. So he goes a couple minutes later. Me and Maharaj, his godbrother, are sitting on the floor, and I can feel it. I'm not the most sensitive person, but I could feel it. Mm. Sitting next to me, just waiting so Prabhupada opens the door, and Prabhupada had relationship with Godbrother. Like I see Mara, Radha, Mara, hug, 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 hug. And Prabhupada had that. Krishna Das Babaji, a Kinshina Krishna. Prabhupada would hug and laugh. They would just hug and laugh. 
Prabhupada be so happy to see him. Him, he walked in the door, Prabhupada went and sat down, you know. <laughs> Hare Krishna. Immediately, it's so nice to see you, Prabhupada said. He said, yes, but your disciple here wasn't letting me see you. Prabhupada looked at me. He said, Sruta Kirti, I told you, whenever he comes, immediately you let him in. <laughs> yes, Prabhupada. I've, he said, okay, you can go now. That was the other part. Seeing him come out of the bedroom, I see that person, that smile, that innocence, the purity. And now I look at him and he's saying that to me. And I thought, what a wonderful, what a wonderful thing he shared with me. And I just offered obeisances and left. So there's only two things. If you don't get anything, two things. Take the order of your spiritual master. When we say is your life and soul, that's what it means. It means your life and your soul, nothing less. Anything less, it's going to take you a very long time to become perfect in Krishna consciousness. Huh? And the other thing is, don't gossip. Prabhupada called me in. My god brothers were in the next room. Mayapur, you could hear a sound. Every sound you could hear in that building. He'd call me in. What are they talking nonsense? Why are they talking all this nonsense? Now it's my god brothers and their GBCs and sannyasis in the rooms next door. Because they only saw one another once a year, so now you have this tendency just to talk. Oh, what's this person doing? Oh, this one, well, he fell down, you know. It's, this happened, that happened. Prabhupada called me in. He said, tell them to be quiet. He said, all they do is gossip. He said, I, I can't tolerate hearing this gossip. He said, tell them to be quiet. He said, this gossip will destroy your Krishna consciousness. He didn't say it'll slow it down. He didn't say it'll stop it for the time being. He said, and he said it to me, he said it to Upendra, he said it to Hari Sari, it'll destroy your Krishna consciousness. If you can't do something in a situation, it's not your service. Concentrate on your service. One little thing I like. Sachinanda Maharaj said, it wasn't his quote, he found it. Humility isn't thinking less of yourself, it's thinking of yourself less. Hmm. We focus on Krishna, not all our perplexities in life. No, no, no. They're there no matter what you do. Our business is to serve our spiritual master. And Prabhupada said, following the instructions of the spiritual master is personal service so don't think the only person doing personal service is the person that's looking at their guru no that doesn't mean anything if you're not following the instructions like you saw in that letter everything if you're following his instructions rigidly then you're doing personal service and that'll take you back home back to godhead okay Hare Krishna, Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. See, I'm inspired just being here with all of you. Do we have time for one question? Anyone have a question? You're last. But <laughs> My wife has a question. I'm sure it's loaded. <laughs> no one else has a question? All right, Vishakit. The Raj Bogue. I never finished <laughs> So Prabhupada took the doll. He said, the doll tastes like mud. He grabbed the puri. He says, who has made these puris? He'd throw it away. Nonsense. By seeing how the deity was being served, he understood everything. That was the piece of rice. The deity plate was the piece of rice. If that pajari is not taking proper care of the deity, you all better get on his case because you're all affected by it. <laughs> that was it. He understood by that plate, nothing here is right because you don't understand. You're worshiping the Supreme Personality of Godhead. You're making him garbage, Prabhupada would say. He would use those words. 
these nasty words. And every time he took it, he would say that. Because every time he took it, Krishna told him, they're not feeding me. I'm starving here. I can't eat this. That's how he knew. Krishna would tell him. He said, Krishna talks to you. You become qualified. He would say, oh, the deity. Sir, new Dwarka. Whew. Most beautiful. That's all he would say. Most beautiful deities. Of course, everyone thought, ah, oh, Prabhupada said, Rukmini Dwarka is the most beautiful. Then he'd go to the manor. Most beautiful deities. So they thought their deities. Most beautiful didn't mean everything else was less. For Prabhupada, everything is most. In Krishna consciousness, there's nothing other than being most, most important. Everything's most important. Krishna is most beautiful. Prashadam has to be the best. He said two kinds of prashadam. Opulent and... What's the other one? Um, some, thank you. Sumptuous. She's my backup, my memory. He said opulent means sugar and ghee. And that's meant for their lordships. Sumptuous means very, very tasty. He said prashadam in the temple should be so tasty, person doesn't even think about going outside. This is what, this is what Prabhupada wants. Not that he wanted. This is what he wants. So we have to have this giant checklist, Prabhupada's desires. And when all those things are ticked, your life, your life will be smooth sailing like Prabhupada in the Atlantic. Huh? After that storm, they said it was like a lake. When you give that total surrender, you'll also be on a lake. And if not, then what do I need to do? Deity worship, summit cleanliness. You know what the summit is? You see the top of that mountain or hill? That's the summit. It means topmost. That's all he asked for. Cleanliness and punctuality, but summit cleanliness. All right, we'll stop here today. We'll continue tomorrow. And those of you who are interested, if you have a question tomorrow, we can even do that. We can spend time doing that, get a little more personal. Otherwise, I can just sit here and I can tell you stories all day tomorrow if you feel like it. So it, it's all up to you and Prabhu, all, all you Prabhus. Remember, you're all Prabhus. Oh, it means something, not artificial, not rituals. We don't do rituals. We're reality. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna.